Okay, please welcome David Lifton. Same thing. Okay. Go ahead. Speak really close to the mic. Hold it. Good morning, everyone. I'm glad to be here in Bismarck, North Dakota today, and I'm happy to see you all. I'm very impressed with the turnout. I'm going to be addressing a sensitive and much Audio. I'm going to be addressing a sensitive and much debated topic, the issue of conspiracy in the Kennedy assassination and its relation to the historical narrative. Specifically, the relationship between these two things, the historical narrative in the Kennedy case and the evidence in the Kennedy case. And let me explain. The evidence, basically, and I'm going to oversimplify a little bit for the purpose of this dialogue, is the rifle traced to Lee Harvey Oswald, which is supposedly the murder weapon, and the three shells found by the window, which were expended from that rifle, the window up on the sixth floor, southeast corner of the Texas School Book Depository. The narrative, of course, is Oswald killed President Kennedy. That's, by the way, how Lyndon Johnson became president, because he was vice president at the time. And in particular, I'm concerned about this other possibility. One, the possibility of bogus evidence, which results in, two, a false historical narrative. Clint Hill, in his keynote address the other day, talked about the first thought that crossed his mind on November 22, 1963 that we had a coup. Now, by no means does he believe any of that today. I understand that. But let's go back to November 22, 1963, and the word coup. A coup by who? Castro didn't take over our government, nor did the Soviet Union, and certainly there were no military units in the street taking over the government of the United States. What there was was an orderly and legal transfer of power from the president to another person, the vice president, and it took place in accordance with the Constitution of the United States and in the context of one man having shot the president, Lee Harvey Oswald. That's how our system works. So, is such talk about a coup justified? Certainly not if Oswald killed the president. If the Warren Commission's evidence is genuine, then Oswald killed the president. If the evidence is genuine, any reasonable person should believe it. Let me assure you, if the evidence in this case is genuine, I would believe it. There's nothing in my DNA which brought me up to question the evidence in this kind of case. I'd like to talk for a moment about the office of the vice president. The office of the vice president was put in so that we'd always have continuity of leadership in case anything happened to the president. The vice president is like someone poised on a legal escalator, standing on a legal escalator, poised to rise if the need arises. Now, changing the focus just a bit, I can tell you without any hesitation that Lee Oswald loved President Kennedy. I know that because I knew his wife for about 15 years. We used to talk all the time on the phone. She basically said that to the Warren Commission but she said it more emphatically to me in these numerous phone conversations, and I finally got her to sit down for an interview in 1990, and I think it's the first one she ever did like this, and you may have seen some of it on YouTube, where she said, I can say without any question in my mind and without any hesitation that Lee adored President Kennedy. Now, I wish she had used those words to the Warren Commission. She didn't, but she used words like like, and he, she couldn't understand why he would do such a thing, because after all, he liked President Kennedy. And his best friend, George de Mornshield, said the same thing, that Lee liked President Kennedy. They were reading the same books. You know, President Kennedy was known for reading James Bond novels. Lee was reading James Bond novels. And there's a number of other examples you can get when you go to the library records of what Lee was reading and what JFK or RFK was reading. 
The situation with LBJ is decidedly different and more complex. And it goes back, at the very least, to July 1960. In July 1960, in the situation at the Democratic Convention in Los Angeles, and it deals with the selection of the Vice President of the United States. And basically, and I've studied this, and I've read the different memoirs, and read all the books and the documents, basically Johnson forced his way onto the ticket. And I want to tell you about what happened. Because as we approached July 13th, 1960, which is a Wednesday, Kennedy basically had all these delegates, and he won on the first ballot, as you know. And Johnson was in town. He hadn't declared his candidacy until uh, earlier in July. Kennedy had declared in, J in January uh, 2nd, I believe it was, 1960. In fact, he's been running. Both men have been running from 1959 onwards, by the way. And um, Kennedy won on the first ballot. And he had decided he wanted Stuart Symington, Senator Stu Symington, of Missouri as his vice presidential uh, candidate. And he told him that the night of July 13th. You're my candidate. Stuart Symington's campaign manager was Clark Clifford, who, by the way, had been a Kennedy family attorney and later became our U.S. Secretary of Defense. And it was brought up to, to, uh, to uh, Clifford that he was the choice. They talked about it. Clifford met with his family that night, Wednesday night. Went to bed. He had a deal. It, and he said, go write your acceptance speech. And that was his first choice for vice president. After midnight, Kennedy won the nomination about 10 o'clock at night. After midnight, he went out to a very famous local restaurant whose name unfortunately escapes me at this moment. And he pulled up a chair at a table with Ben Bradley of the Washington Post. And it's about 1 o'clock in the morning, and he's tapped on the shoulder. And he's tapped on the shoulder by, I believe it was Tip O'Neill, a young congressman, that Sam Rayburn wanted to speak to him. There were no cell phones then. And exactly how this was handled, I'm not sure. Probably he took a taxi cab, but he ends up back at the Biltmore Hotel, and there's meetings. And it's made indelibly clear to JFK that he must choose Lyndon Johnson, who was Senate Majority Leader, as his running mate, or there's going to be big time trouble, there's going to, the nomination will be worthless, there's going to be a floor fight, and a lot of other problems. In fact, Seymour Hersh revealed in 1999 in his book, The Dark Side of Camelot, that there was blackmail used, sexual blackmail, and that it was made very clear to Kennedy that he was going to have to choose LBJ as his veep, or there was going to be big trouble. And so he was up all night, and Bobby was up all night, and they had to decide what to do about this situation. And they said, OK, they th JFK threw in the towel. He said, I have enough problems on my mind and enough problems to deal with here. Uh, I'm going to choose Lyndon Johnson. And he did. Jack's, Jack Lowe, the famous photographer, who was a with President Kennedy in all of the private moments, was with him at the first meeting they had with Lyndon Johnson on Thursday, July 14th, 1960. And the picture I have up on the screen here tells a great story. Um, this picture shows the beginning of the whole problem with Lyndon Johnson and um, Bobby Kennedy, because JFK deputized Bobby to go down to the suite and ask Johnson to please withdraw. They couldn't do it. There's going to be a floor fight. And Johnson started crying with Bobby Kennedy. No, if the president wants me, I want to be his vice president, and so on and so forth. And so this picture was snapped by Jock Slow. And by the way, it was a famous picture, and it was run as one of a series of pictures in Life magazine. You may not know this, but on 9-11, when the plane crashed into the World Trade Center, all of Jock Slow's negatives were destroyed in the building at the World Trade Center. And his daughter did the lovely task of going to the proof sheets and using digital technology to save these photographs for history. I and mean, this one is just... A, a great photograph because it shows the beginning of this problem on Thursday, July 14th. JFK, who was kind of more uh, abstract, looking at Johnson and Bobby glaring at him and looking up with that look. I mean, it, it's picture speaks a thousand words. But that's when the problem started. Now, Lyndon Johnson was Senate Majority Leader at the time. And it's a very powerful position. And the question was running in the newspapers, major columns, one of them, and I didn't get a chance to prepare a PowerPoint slide of this, shows Doris Fleeson, one of the major nationally syndicated columnists, and she wrote her column and it said in the headline, what's in it for Lyndon? Why in the world would the Senate Majority Leader want to be Vice President? It just didn't make any sense. But Lyndon Johnson, 
told his wife, and there were discussions about this, and he jabbed his finger in her chest in front of reporters and said, Bird, Bird, he said, I'll be a heartbeat away. And he said this openly, and it was no secret about it, and this was in books that have been published since then. Bird, I'll be a heartbeat away. And on January 20th, 1961, on the day of the inauguration, he was driving in a vehicle with the wife of Henry Luce, Claire Booth Luce. Henry Luce was the publisher of Time Magazine. And Claire Booth Luce was pestering Johnson in a good-natured way, Lyndon, why did you take this job? Why would you want to be vice president? And he kept answering with these answers that didn't make any sense. And finally, he turned to her and said, Claire, I'm a gambling man. One out of every four of them dies in office. That's what Lyndon Johnson said on the day of the inauguration. And when JFK raised his right hand and took the oath, Bobby Baker, who was Lyndon Johnson's, one of his top aides, was across the way in a building with his insurance executive, Don Reynolds. And according to FBI reports after the assassination, he says to Don Reynolds, as JFK is taking the oath, the SOB is being sworn in, but he will not live out his term. He will die a violent death. That's January 20th, 1961. Now, I know you've probably heard stories that Lyndon Johnson was worried about nuclear war on the day of the assassination and all of that. But let me tell you what Lyndon Johnson was really worried about. And again, this is in his own words from the LBJ Library and from an oral history that Johnson himself gave and which was discovered by a professor at Rice University in Texas. And this is one of the earliest oral histories at the LBJ Library. And the person speaking is LBJ himself in September 1969, about seven to eight months after Johnson uh, left office. He said he thought Kennedy, and I'm going to read this word for word, Siri, he thought Robert Kennedy seriously considered whether he would let me be president, whether he should really take the position that the vice president didn't automatically move in. I thought that was on his mind every time I saw him the first few days after I had already taken the oath. I think he was seriously calculating what steps to take. You won't read this in any of the standard history books, but it's at the LBJ Library. Let me assure you that LBJ had nothing to worry about if the evidence in this case is genuine. Now, it was also probably on RFK's mind because, as this picture shows, and there's a lot of evidence to indicate, this, and this comes from Arthur Schlesinger himself, RFK viewed Lyndon Johnson as a usurper. And I'll give you the definition of the word usurp. To take the place of another without legal authority, to supplant. So there was very bad blood, very bad blood, between these two, and it goes back to July of 1960. Now, before going forward, I wanted to say what happened after uh, JFK was inaugurated. They immediately realized they had a problem on their hands with Lyndon Johnson. First of all, he wanted to ride on Air Force One a lot with JFK. You can't do that for security reasons. They had to say, no, you can't do that. Secondly, he wanted an office next to JFK's Oval Office. No, you can't have that. You're going to be in the executive office building. He wanted to be in charge of national security affairs. No, you can't have that. So there were all these problems. They gave him the space program to look after. They knew they had a problem with Lyndon Johnson. And there's something I'd like to talk about before I go on with the rest of my talk. And I was urged to do this last night by John Martinson, my good friend here, who was listening to me talk about this. And he said, you ought to tell that to the audience. Back in 1969, when I first got involved in research on this, and you'll hear more about this in a few minutes, I began to realize, I started to wonder how the administration, who filled certain positions in the administration. I was particularly concerned in the beginning with the Secret Service, but I was also concerned with positions in the Navy, because that's where the autopsy was conducted at Bethesda Naval Hospital. And I became aware as I looked into different areas that Johnson had aggressively lobbied to put his people in place in various positions in the government from the beginning. And so I set up a filing system because I was looking in the New York Times index. Now today you use Google and it might be much easier. But I mean, I was piling up a lot of paper looking into this. And I called this embryo government theory. And the hypothesis was that inside the administration of John F. Kennedy, was the embryo government of Lyndon Johnson. And the, I mean, today, I would never say that today. I would not say that inside the administration of Barack Obama is the embryo government of Joe Biden 
or inside the administration of Jimmy Carter, who was the embryo government of Walter Mondale. But this is what was going on. And Johnson, for, right away, had his campaign manager made Secretary of the Navy, John Connolly. Um, there were promotions and appointments in the Secret Service immediately, within days, months. Sam Rayburn, his mentor, wrote a letter to President Kennedy on April, 16, uh, April 17, 1961, saying, we want the size of the Secret Service increased. We want to add a duplicate detail for the Vice President so that Lyndon Johnson will have just as many agents as John Kennedy on 24-7 rotation. And so this letter was written. I had a copy of it at the time from the congressional record. I found it somewhere. Then they had to go and have budget hearings. They had to appropriate money because this is the way things are done. And this didn't happen until 62. So it was a whole new contingent of agents were hired. Then there was the Secretary of State. Johnson didn't want Dean Rusk. He wanted uh, Senator Fulbright. And there was all kinds of lobbying going on. And Fulbright got knocked out. And Secretary Rusk, who on November 22nd, had taken the entire cabinet of the United States out of the country for a trip to Tokyo. They were all on one plane with Secretary of Rusk, Secretary of State Rusk. So there was all this stuff going on, and I was aware of it. And if I was a history professor, oh, then I got interested in, well, what about the city of Dallas, the municipal government? When did the mayor of Dallas run for office? He was the brother of the CIA direct, deputy director. That happened in January and February of 1961, at the time of the inauguration. When was the Texas School Book Depository? When, when, who owned that building anyway? That turned out that things were going on there. That building was leased to a new person. The Texas School Book Depository Company moved from another location across the street into the location called 411 Elm uh, in July 1961, uh, 1963. So I was tracing all these things. And if there are graduate students here who wish to have a thesis topic, I would say set up a series of files like I did EGT, forward slash, Secretary of State, Navy, Bethesda Naval Hospital, Secret Service, Mayor of Dallas. And you'll find the movements of all these different officials, which I personally believe, and you'll see why I feel I have justification as my talk unfolds, were the movements of pieces on the chessboard before this event to create what I call um, the embryo government of Lyndon Johnson within the administration of John F. Kennedy and for different reasons, maybe policy or the Secret Service. The whole line of uh, the, Secret the uh, Treasury Department changed. They took the uh, Secret Service box on the organization chart and the official organization chart and shifted it from one secret sec reporting to one, sec excuse me, one assistant secretary of the Treasury to another. There were all these changes. I used to be brimming with these organization charts, hearings, and seeing all this maneuvering going on. So to me, this whole business of when the shots were fired, to me, that's the climax of a whole series of events, and you'll see why I think that's relevant. But I thought I'd mention EGT. It gives me, it's always given me political context for this, and to me, it's been movement of pieces on the chessboard. Now, let's get back to Dallas on November 22, 1963. There are two ways of looking at this case. I call them Reality 1 and Reality 2. Reality 1 is Oswald did it. Reality two is the appearance that was created that Oswald did it. Let me spell it out. In reality one, the car comes down the street and three shots are fired from a sniper's nest by the sixth floor window where later a rifle is found that was mail ordered to Lee Oswald's post office box 2915 in March 1963. That's the supposed murder weapon. In reality two, the car comes down the street a phony sniper's nest has been set up by the sixth floor window. A suitable scapegoat has been pre-selected and pre-positioned at the location of the Texas School Book Depository. And in this case, that scapegoat, if this reality too would apply, would be Lee Oswald, who lived in the Soviet Union for over two and a half years, going there in October 59 and returning in June 62. And he had intelligence connections. Now, I want to make sure I use my clicker here and make sure I know how to do this. That's Lee Oswald, and that's the day he arrived on October 30, uh, he arrived on October 16th, 1959, and um, he was in a suit and everything, and, he, and on October 31st, I believe, is the day he had this interview with UPI, and, they, and I wish this, this PowerPoint slide was bigger, it's a very handsome photograph of Lee, and um, this is the picture of Lee and Marina leaving the Soviet Union uh, 
leaving Minsk in uh, May 62. There's a whole story about Lee Oswald, and I'm telling you, if you've tried to study the Kennedy assassination, you soon get involved in the study of Lee Oswald and his life, not to mention everything else I've just talked about in this case, which is promotions and appointments and a lot of other stuff. Okay. Now, in reality, too, suitable scapegoat was pre-selected, and he's at the building, and professional snipers kill the president, and arrangements have been made. Now, listen carefully to this, because you've never heard this before. Arrangements have been made to bring the president to a medical facility, remove bullets, and alter wounds. Why? To create the false appearance that Oswald's rifle was a murder weapon. To create the foundation for a false autopsy. Remember, the body of the deceased is the diagram of the shooting. And I cannot stress that too much. The body of the deceased constitutes a diagram of the shooting in a case of this type. That's what happens at the autopsy. They towed up the wounds. They say, here's the trajectories. It entered here and it exited there. And so if you want to change that diagram or change the facts, you've got to deal with the body. Well, there's an alternative. I mean, you could have, theoretically, someone walk into the autopsy room with a suitcase filled with money and say, Dr. So-and-so, I want you to lie about the, the wounds on this body. Here, I'm going to deposit sex money to your bank account. You tell us a lie. That's not what happened in this case. Now, I've told you that this could be reality one and reality two. Reality one is the Warren Report. Reality two is this much more elaborate situation which I have just suggested. Both have the same sniper's nest. Both have the same rifle. And the question I pose is, how would you know one from the other? How would you know if it's false or real? I mean, you remember the old advertisement, is it real or is it Memorex? How would you know the difference between reality one and reality two? Now, you could say, well, Somebody might have a stenographic transcript of a meeting where some group of people got together and said, you know, we're going to set up this elaborate scheme to kill the president, and we have this meeting, and here's what we're going to do, and somebody word leaked out, and they had the steno transcript, that would be evidence. I'm not going to talk about that because I don't have any evidence like that. The answer to determining the difference between reality one and reality two comes down to the autopsy, the validity of the autopsy on the body of JFK. The body of JFK, and I have to articulate this again because it's not at first obvious, the body of JFK was the most important evidence in the case against Lee Harvey Oswald. Implicitly we know that, but it's not really obvious. I first learned this in 1966 in a New York University NYU Law Review article by a fellow named Jay Schwartz, and it really gave me pause, my God. You know, it's not the autopsy report which everybody talks about and argues about, it's the body. It's the body that has the wounds. The autopsy report is a description of what's on the body. Now, I would like to talk about what happened to me a little bit in 1966. Now, those of you who have read my book know some of this. And I'm going to advance this clicker. I was at UCLA as a graduate student and met a professor who had been on the Warren Commission. He's one of the counsel on the staff of the Warren Commission. His name was Wesley Liebler. Liebler was a professor at the UCLA Law School. I walked into his office one day in 1965. I already had bought the 26 volumes of the Warren Commission. And I was a student at the engineering school. And I introduced myself. I noticed when I walked in, he had the same 26 volumes on a bookshelf, as if he was one of these Warren Commission critics, only he was a staff attorney on the Warren Commission. And we got to know one another, and right away, I mean, there was a tension and all that, but he was a very funny man. He was the kind of professor, if you're a student, and you know this, what I'm talking about, the kind of professor you never forget, because he was very bright and very funny, and he had a very dark sense of humor. So we would argue about the Warren Commission report, and I had an in right to the heart of the way the Warren Commission functioned, because Liebler was telling me about it, and he had all these documents lying around his office, and he would let me see some of them, and... and that's how I got my first introduction to the working papers of the Warren Commission. He had a big safe, a steamer trunk in his office, which he wasn't supposed to have, but he took out documents now and then it would show me. And this stuff was at the National Archives, of course, and it was available, but I didn't have to go to Washington. Liebler showed me some of this stuff. Now, in the beginning, and because I was a physics major, I was puzzled over the Zapruder film. Not puzzled. I shouldn't say puzzled. I was really outraged because on the film you could see the President Kennedy, it seemed to me, was thrown backwards and therefore must have been hit from the front. And I challenged him about this. 
And I was also amazed at the conflicting opinions of the two groups of doctors. The Dallas doctors who saw the body and said President Kennedy was shot from the front. Now that's what they said on November 22, 1963, because they had an entry wound at the front of the throat, or that's what they thought, and there was a blowout at the back of the head about the size of an egg, maybe larger. But you had entry at the front, exit at the back of the head, there were different ways of theorizing about this. Some said, well, one bullet went in here and another went in somewhere else and came out the back of the head, or maybe one went in the front and climbed up the spinal column and blew out the rear, but it was shots from the front. Now, at the time of the autopsy, the doctor said something different. That night, supposedly, they said he was shot twice from behind. They had an entry at the back of the shoulder and an exit at the front of the throat and an entry at the back of the head and an exit in the forward right-hand side of the head. So... That's what we would argue about. And I, I told Liebler that I just didn't believe the autopsy report because the doctors had burned their first draft. There was a certification of that in the uh, 26 volumes. And um, I said, they're lying. And we would argue about whether the autopsy doctors could lie or not. And I said, they're military, they're lying. I was 27 years old. And he uh, ridiculed that idea that they were lying. And he said, I didn't know what I was talking about. I'd like to get you in my, one of my law classes someday, Lifton, he would say. He said, you can't, you can't reason like that? That's absurd. So we would, we would discuss this quite a bit. And we now come to October 1966. And it was always on my mind how to reconcile this and to come up with a hypothesis in which the doctors weren't lying because I wanted to be pleased Professor Liebler and fit with the way he viewed the evidence. But I knew that the head went back. So anyway, I'm reading the Seabrit and O'Neill FBI report, which had just been released at the National Archives some months before. And I've put on, up on the screen some of these pages and what they look like. These were not in the 26 volumes, by the way. They should have been, but our inspector, for whatever reason, didn't put the little gizmo on the document so it would end up being published. And so here was the first page and the second page. And I come to the third page, and there's this passage that says, that when the president's body, now these are the two FBI agents that met the plane at Andrews Air Force Base. They, they was transported, placed on the autopsy table, wrappings were removed from the body, in which time it was noticed that there was an additional wrapping that was saturated with blood that was on the head. And following the removal of this additional wrapping, it was ascertained that the president's clothing had been removed, and it was also apparent that a trach had been performed, as well as surgery of the head area, namely in the top of the skull. Now, no surgery had been performed at Parkland Hospital. All they did was a little tracheotomy. No surgery. And yet this FBI report was saying the surgery of the head area, namely in the top of the skull. Well, let me tell you, I was, I was I, first of all, I was nauseated because I knew that this was not clinical surgery. This was the kind of thing they call pathological surgery, surgery done in connection with an autopsy where you, you cut up the body for reasons of pathology. And, um, of course, I was also thinking to myself, Boy, what's going to happen when I show this to Professor Liebler? Because this is the answer, perhaps, as to why the doctors don't lie, because somebody did something to the body. So, let me see if I can go. So what happened was I had a meeting with him. We scheduled a meeting. In fact, I was on TV with him on October 23rd. And, uh, and our arguments always came down to this. He would always say, well, where are the bullets of these other assassins? Where are the bullets? You know, and, of course, I held my tongue at this TV program I was on. And I said to him afterwards, I said, we have to meet tomorrow, and I, this is really important. And he set aside several hours in the law office of Joe Ball in Beverly Hills, and Joe Ball had been attorney on the Warren Commission. So we went into this beautiful conference room on Monday, October 24th, 66. He sits down, and he's looking at me expectantly, like, what do you have for me today, David? And I said, and we went through the usual argument, and I kind of provoked him a little bit. And he came up with his usual thing of, oh, where's the bullets? Where's the bullets of these other assassins? And I said, oh, that's simple, Jim. And I went over behind his chair, and um, I said, before the autopsy, and I put my hand across his head, and I said, they simply cut into the head and took the bullets out. And I said, and that's why it says in an FBI report that there had been surgery in the head area, namely in the top of the skull. And he looks at me as if I'm crazy, and he slams his fist on the table, and I, I don't want to slam my fist on this podium as hard as he did, because I don't want to disrupt the sound equipment here. But he says, where does it say that? And I tossed the Siebert and O'Neill report across the table at him, and he's reading it, 
And he goes, do you realize what you found? You found new evidence. Well, that was an interesting term because it was always saying, there's no new evidence in this case. And he's giving me the honor of saying, I found new evidence. Now, <clears throat> it didn't stop with the FBI report, let me assure you, because I'd already done a day's worth of research and I knew the autopsy had all these strange passages in it about cuts this and cuts that. And one of them had to do with this linear cut in the brain. So I read him this passage. I said, look at this. The doctor is trying to say something here, Jim. They called Wesley J. Liebler, Jim Liebler. And it talked about a cut in the brain from the tip of the occipital lobe to the tip of the frontal lobe. It was about this deep. Well, he's not going to take my word for it. I mean, I'm a graduate of engineering physics from Cornell, but what do I know about biology and pathology? So <clears throat> he gets, grabs the phone in Joe Ball's office, and he calls up a pathologist, one of his friends in Long Beach, California. And he says, Joe, I'm going to read you a description of a brain, and I want you to tell me the cause of death. So he starts reading this technical stuff that I typed out for him. And then there's a pause. And then he, I hear him say something like, well, what does it matter whose brain it is? You know, I'm just asking you a question. He says, okay, thank you very much. He gets the answer. He hangs up. I said, what did he say? He says, sounds like he was hit with an ax. I said, what are we going to do? He says, I guess we'll have to get the FBI to jimmy up some evidence that Oswald ordered an ax. That's Monday, October 24th, 1966. Let me tell you something. It took me some time to come to terms with this because the next thing Liebler did, by the way, he didn't stop there. He started calling up Warren Commission attorneys. He called up Arlen Inspector on the phone. He called up others. He also picked up the phone and called this woman who was the smartest law student at UCLA. If she wasn't the smartest, she was the second smartest. Her first name was Susan, and he um, said, I want you to get over here right away, Susan. Lifton's found surgery. Now, that always wondered about that conversation as to why they could talk so cryptically, because I now believe that he had thought of this before I did, but, but had not found any evidence for it. But anyway, she comes over, and she's amazed by what I found, and she's saying things like, David, do you realize how famous Jim's going to be when he announces this? And I was, you know, well, that's great. I'm glad we've solved the Kennedy assassination. Somebody altered the body. I mean, did I think, I thought in those terms, kind of simple-minded then or simplified. Anyway, she's, he's talking to her, and he's, he had called up these attorneys on the Warren Commission, and he called the pathologist, and there was, at the beginning, I have to say, it took me some time, days, weeks, maybe a couple of months, to really understand the significance of what this means, because I didn't get it in the beginning, even though I thought I did. I thought, in the beginning, when I first discovered this on that weekend and was studying this stuff, oh, I found this interesting, clever trick in which they hid the grassy and old assassin by taking the bullet out of the body. And I said, that's really clever. That's why there's no other bullets. But that is not what this is all about. This is not about hiding the grassy and old assassin. It took me a week or a month or two to fully understand what the real issue is, which was fraud in the evidence. That's what this is all about. It doesn't matter whether the second or third assassin is hiding in a sewer or behind a fence or in behind a bush. The question is the integrity of the evidence. And one of the other passages in this FBI report, the FBI records how the doctors are looking at the body and they're puzzled. And they say they're, at a quote, at a loss to explain why they can find no bullets. That's that night in the autopsy room. So Liebler... I, we said, well, what are we going to do about this? What is he going to do about this? I mean, he got very interested then in all the technical issues connected with the autopsy. And he said, now, this didn't all happen overnight. It happened over the course of a few days. There were conversations back and forth between he and I. And I said to myself, I mean, I've really got to make a record of this. This is really unusual. So I bought a tape recorder. As a matter of fact, I bought a tape recorder because I started calling the Dallas doctors right away. I wanted to know... I knew about the head wound, that something had changed in the head, but I wanted to know about this little tracheotomy. So I started calling up the Dallas doctors and asking them on the phone. Now, you say, how could I do this? Well, Liebler's course was on the wire service. Everybody knew Wesley Liebler was conducting a course on the Warren Commission. So I'd say, well, I'm a student at UCLA, and I'm given this, assigned this job to find out what's the length of the tracheotomy incision. Sorry to pester you, but uh, that's my question. And Dr. Perry tells me on the phone the trach incision he made was two to three centimeters. And I said, well, could it have been three and a half? Well, I didn't think so. What about four? 
Well, I didn't really think that. What about five? I, you know, I sound like Columbo on the phone. To get up to the size of what's in the autopsy report, which was seven to eight centimeters with, quote, widely gaping irregular edges. But that's when I bought my recorder. I, after the Perry phone call, I said, I'm going to get this stuff on tape. So I recorded everyone I talked to, including Liebler, who, by the way, had the same idea. He knew I had been a ham radio operator. He said, I've got to get a thing to record these conversations. <laughs> Can you help me out there? So he had a recorder, and I had a recorder. Anyway, he said, I'm going to write a letter. Excuse me. He said, I am going to write a memorandum to Chief Justice Warren. So he... And he didn't, it's not an easy memo to write. You try to write about the autopsy, you get involved in days and weeks and hours of study. So we started having meetings, and he had two of these law students with him, and one of them, I don't remember the name of one of them, one of them was named Steve Myers, and if you've heard of the law firm of Jacoby and Myers, that was the Myers from Jacoby and Myers. So we had these meetings, and he wanted every single thing about the autopsy brought to the meetings. I brought my stuff, Steve brought his. And Liebler sat down and wrote a 13-page memorandum about the autopsy. And I'm on page six of this memo. And he called for basically a reopening of the investigation, a limited reopening of the investigation. The memorandum is dated November 8, 1966. He transmitted it on November 16, 1966. And it went to Chief Justice Warren, every member of the Warren Commission, that is the other six members of the commission, about 10 members of the staff, the Kennedy family, and the Department of Justice, i.e. President Johnson through his attorney, who is uh, Ramsey Clark. This is that memo, and I'm not asking you to read every page of it, but here's a whole bunch of questions and issues, and I'm very proud of this page, of course. I put it in my book. Attention was first drawn, uh, the Siebert and O'Neill statement had been surgery, the head area. Attention was first drawn to this by Mr. Lifton, He's quite familiar with the report, the underlying evidence. He's agreed not to focus public attention on this matter until an attempt has been made to effect a responsible analysis of the autopsy photos and x-rays. In assessing the probable public reaction to a statement concerning surgery in the president's head, it should be noted that neither the Siebert O'Neill report, anyway, or any of this was in the 26 volumes of the Warren Commission. Now, he was a little concerned about me because I had been with Ramparts Magazine that previous summer and published a 30,000-word cover story called The Case of Three Assassins. Of course, I had suddenly outgrown that. I knew it wasn't a matter of two or three assassins, but it was a really good article on the medical evidence in Ramparts, published in January 67. And so, you know, he didn't know that I might go back to Warren Hinkle, the publisher, and we'd have a big cover story about surgery on the body. Of course, I knew something that he didn't, which is Warren Hinkle really didn't have the cojones to do anything like that. I did, because I was really concerned. I was coming at this from the standpoint of physics. I felt, huh, they altered the body. That's what this case is going to turn out to be all about. But anyway, that's what happened. So the memorandum goes out, and then here's his transmittal letter on November 16th. He's enclosing the memo, and it is a list of 16 people he sends it to, starting with Chief Justice Warren, Russell, Cooper, Boggs. And by the way, today, if you go to the... Dulles put his papers, Alan Dulles was a commissioner at Princeton, you'll find a memo at Princeton, you'll find a memo where Ford has his papers. And then Wesley Lieberler gets a letter from J. Lee Rankin uh, on December 1st, 1966. And it basically says, the case is closed, if you want to do anything about this, you're a private citizen, you're on your own, we're not going to go and reopen this case, whatever the autopsy report said is, as far as we're concerned, the best evidence of what happened in this case, etc. So that was the end of that gambit. But it wasn't the end for me because that's when I started really looking into this and took time off. And I thought, well, I'm just going to write this up in a year and I'll have a nice monograph on the assassination. Well, little did I know. I mean, it took 15 years before it was over. And my book, Best Evidence, was published in January 81. Okay. Now, I know I'm relating things from 47 years ago, but they're relevant because the issue has really not changed. Oh, here's part of the copy, li copy sent list for Rankin. They all, each of them communicated to about 16 of the other people. One told Chief Justice Warren and 16 others, look at this new evidence, and the other one, Rankin writes back, we're not gonna do anything about it, and he has the same 16 people. Okay, here is what I found and published in Best Evidence. That the picture on the left is the diagram of the wound as described by Dr. Robert McClelland and other Dallas doctors. They don't all say identical things, but it's a small wound at the back of the head. One told me, in 1966 or 67 early, it's about the size of an egg. 
a hen's egg, he said. I remember we had a conversation about that, because I, being a city boy, didn't understand what a hen's egg is. I mean, he finally convinced me, he said, like a chicken egg. You know, when you go to the market, you get an egg. The hen lays the egg. He says, that's the size of the wound. So the one on the right is the picture of the way the, the hole was at Bethesda, according to the verbal description in the autopsy report. Chiefly proprietal, but extending somewhat into the occipital area. And of course, the cerebellum in Dallas was hanging out of the wound. And the cerebellum, I didn't put the slide in here, is at the bottom of the back of the head. And you've seen this stuff debated in books and on the internet. And people try to explain, well, there's no difference. And people who support my book will say there's a big difference. Anyway, that's the head wounds. Now, then you have the neck wound. Now, I was calling up the Dallas doctors about the neck wound. And the picture I'm about to show you is the autopsy photograph of Kennedy, the stare of death photo. Many of you have seen it on the internet, but I just wanted to prepare you for it. I got these pictures and was the first one to publish them. In, I got them in 1982, and I'll tell you about that in a bit. But I published them in my book in 1988, in the third edition of Best Evidence. I went to Dallas as soon as I got these pictures in 82, and I was showing the pictures to the Dallas doctors and nurses and almost uniformly, they say, no, that's not the way the head looked, and that's not the throat wound that we saw. Now, that, is, that large gap is not the trach incision that Dr. Perry told me he made. And we call this the stare of death photograph. And I'm going to tell you that you can't argue about this case using just verbal descriptions. You've got to have these pictures and deal with these pictures. And then there's questions about the authenticity of these pictures and whether they've been doctored. But I'm not going to get into that right now. OK, now, the problem I want to address is this, and the one I addressed back in 1966 and 1967. Excuse me. OK, I had a hypothesis that something happened to the body. And the question was, where? The where and when problem. Now, when I met with Liebler, and I didn't bring his notes, he made two pages of notes. And we were both talking about where could anything have happened? And, and we traced the journey of the body, and he left these notes in my book. And I'm, I'm glad I have them. There's really a great memento of that meeting we had that day. Because talking to him was like talking to any Kennedy assassination researcher. He had an open mind in the beginning, and he was going to do something about it until he got slapped down by Rankin. Now, you can't have alteration without opportunity. And so you deal with what in law is called the chain of possession. Now, anybody who's watched CSI or Law and Order, you know. And when evidence is found at a crime scene, A hands it to B, hands it to C, hands it to D. And it goes from the crime scene to the courtroom, and it's always supposed to have a proper chain of custody. And that's true also of the body, which is the most important evidence in the case. So a quick run through, we're going to go a little quick run through about the chain of possession on the body. OK, here we are in Dallas in the parking lot outside, with, uh, outside Parkland Hospital, and Mrs. Kennedy's about to get into the ambulance. And then she's in the ambulance, and the coffin's been put in the ambulance, and the ambulance is now leaving for Love Field. And there's another picture of the ambulance leaving for Love Field. And now we come to the ambulance. This cream-colored hearse arrives at Love Field, where Air Force One is parked. <coughs> and in fact, unknown to the Kennedys, LBJ is aboard their aircraft. And this is very important to know. When LBJ left Parkland Hospital, he told Kenny O'Donnell, I'm going to get back to Washington right away. That's the impression he left with Kenny. And there were two airplanes there, Air Force One and Air Force Two. And LBJ basically said, I'm going back on. Well, he didn't say I'm going back in Air Force Two, but he left the impression, I'm going back to Washington on my airplane, and you can be with Mrs. Kennedy and the body on your airplane. In fact, in this left, this one? Wow. Well, OK, hold it, hold it, OK. Well, OK. LB, LBJ went to the aircraft, and, um, and he got on the plane, and he started shutting all the drapes on the plane. And he had deceived Kenny O'Donnell as to which plane he's on. The Kennedys got onto the plane, and the coffin was carried up onto the plane. And here's the swearing in that took place, because then he said, you know, I've got to, he said, I've got to um, be sworn in. Bobby told me to be sworn in. So here's LBJ at the front of the plane or in the mid of the plane, Jacqueline Kennedy's at the ceremony, and he places his hand in the Bible, and he's sworn in. And then the plane flies to Washington, D.C., and there's an offload at Bethesda, excuse me, at Andrews Air Force Base. And then that ambulance with Mrs. Kennedy in the ambulance goes to Bethesda Naval Hospital. Now, there's a problem. That ambulance arrived at Bethesda Naval Hospital at 6.55. That's five minutes to seven. But 
the body of President Kennedy arrived 20 minutes earlier. And we know that today, and I found that stuff out and published it in 1981 in my book, Best Evidence. Witnesses who know that the body arrived at 20 minutes before the coffin. How did that happen? And there's now a document, the boy agent receipt, because he was head of the marine security detail. So the question becomes, how did the body get out of the coffin, and how did that happen? Um, when you start looking at this, the conclusion, you have to figure out how the body got out of the coffin, and you have to start at Bethesda Naval Hospital and back time it, and you have to go back and treat it like a movie running in reverse. And if the body was not in the coffin at the front of Bethesda Naval Hospital, then it wasn't in the coffin when the plane took off from Dallas because there's nothing in between. The body was placed in the coffin at Parkland Hospital. It was in the coffin on Air Force One. And then the plane took off, so what happened? Now, I used to believe that the body was taken out of the coffin before takeoff. And I put that in my book, that that was the only possibility I could think of. But after my book was published, Godfrey McHugh, the Air Force aide, said, he insisted, he was with the coffin all the time. And I said, no, he couldn't have been because the body wasn't in the coffin. And he had been running around in the plane wanting to know why they weren't taking off and what is this business about a delay for a swearing in. Well, this went on for some time, trying to figure out what happened. And I couldn't understand it. And two years later, I realized there was another time when the body, when the Kennedy party wasn't with the coffin. And that other time was when the coffin went up onto the plane and the Kennedy party was still down on the tarmac. And and you see them here, and there's Roy Kellerman, and he's carrying the coffin up onto the plane. So that's when they're down on the tarmac, and he's bringing the body up on the plane, and then Mrs. Kennedy goes up on the plane. There's a few minutes in there before she gets up into the fuselage. That's the only time the body could have been taken off the plane. And I'm just telling you that an empty casket at the Bethesda front entrance means an empty casket on takeoff from Dallas. And... We, when we revisit the events, we find out that the only time, as I told you, was that period, and I'm just going to go back here, and what that means is that in the minutes before she gets on the plane, Kellerman and the other agents got the body out of the coffin and took it off the starboard side of the plane. Now, in final charade, I'll be presenting the evidence that there was a forklift truck on the starboard side of the plane and the body was taken off the starboard side of the plane and put in the forward luggage area. And there was a photographer taking pictures. His name was Jimmy Darnell. He was on the roof of one of the cargo buildings. And he filmed this whole thing, but he didn't know what he's filming. He doesn't know what his telephoto lens has. And as immediately as he climbs down from his ledge, he's accosted by the deputy police chief of Dallas, uh, Fisher, who demands his film and camera and tells him that what he has photographed is, quote, sacrilegious. That's what he said. The rest of this story I'm going to tell you about uh, quickly as I can because I wanted to save more in the, in the breakout room, but I want to tell you about what happened. There's a forklift truck was used on the starboard side. I have a witness to the forklift truck, the pilot of Air Force Two who's now passed on, about the forklift truck. The body was removed from the plane, put in the forward luggage area. The photographer, Jimmy Darnell, I've told you about his experience. How do I know it's in the front, front of the plane? How do I know these kinds of things went on? Because there's a blood trail. The most important, and I'm going to talk about this blood trail, of course, in Final Charade, but I'm going to sum it up for you right now. First of all, there was a blood trail on board Air Force One. Kellerman, who had been at the top of the ramp with the coffin during the flight back, was in the jump seat. His shirt was stained in blood from the neck down. Dr. Berkeley had blood on his sleeves. That was reported in the New York Times that weekend. Dr. Berkeley... Um, wrote a report the next week to explain this, uh, which I have the report, and the report says that he, the reason he had blood on his sleeves was that at Parkland Hospital, he reached into a garbage can to get a rose as a souvenir for Mrs. Kennedy. That's the blood trail for um, Dr. Berkeley. Then there's a problem with LBJ in the bathroom. LBJ, first of all, was the back of the plane when the coffin came on board. I know that now from Air Force records and I, Air Force witnesses who were interviewed by an associate of mine named Sean Fetter, who made it his project, and we can talk about that in the breakout room. Okay. Um, so, LBJ um, ended up in the bathroom on Air Force One. Godfrey McHugh was looking for, where is LBJ on the airplane? They found him in the bathroom, and with Kenny O'Donnell, um, and, and, and McHugh found him in the bathroom, and um, LBJ was screaming at them, 
Get out of here, get out of here, close the door. The Secret Service told me to hide in here. There's a worldwide conspiracy. And when LBJ emerged from the bathroom, he had changed his shirt. To which I responded, maybe the Secret Service told him, you know, there's a worldwide conspiracy. Now, we want you to go into the bathroom and change your shirt. Now, there's another problem in the galley area. There was blood in the galley area, I believe, and there was a problem with that. And that problem was solved between 2.18 when the body went aboard and 2.38 of the swearing in. What they did is LBJ and his buddy, Congressman Thomas, said, we want vegetable soup. This is before the swearing in. So they started opening cans of vegetable soup in the galley. And that is the way that the blood problem was solved, and we can talk about that more later. I want to tell you something. If this was a corporate jet going from city A to city B, you'd arrest these people. You wouldn't let somebody become president of the United States. You'd find out what the heck happened to the body when it went on Air Force One, and how come it went off the starboard side, and what was it doing in the forward luggage area, because how do I know it's there? Because there's blood there, too, and there was a cleanup that went on at Andrews Air Force Base that night for about seven hours. Now, you'll be reading about that in Final Charade, and that's evidence. Now, let me tell you about the condition of the body when the president's body reached Bethesda Naval Hospital, and you will not read about this in the Warren Report. It was stained in blood. It was an absolute mess. It was a bloody mess. One arm was raised, as in a quote, Heil Hitler salute, said this senior army officer who told me about it. None of this is in the autopsy report. The doctor called for a Tide and a scrub brush and a pail of water, and they scrubbed the body to make it acceptable for the autopsy. That's what they did. And um, I had a, I don't know if I have it here, but I brought my own thing of Tide to show you that they had to do that to the body to make the body cleaned up for the autopsy. Then the doctor had to get up on the table and force the arm down. That's what he had to do, and he did that by putting his knee in the armpit and forcing the arm down. That is not in the autopsy report. The doctor was then told by the senior military official, Edward Kenny, and a rear admiral, you are to determine the cause of death. Now, on a timeline, there's everything that's anti-mortem, that's when you're alive, and then there's post-mortem, and in between, at that dividing line, is the time of death. The doctor was ordered to restrict his examination to the cause of death and not to what happened to the body after death. That's, in effect, what happened. What I'm here to tell you is that this autopsy is a fraud. This means that the connection between Oswald's rifle and Kennedy's death is based on fraudulent evidence. The problem in dealing with all this is logical, not, is not logical, but psychological because this is a body-centric plot, and it's hard to believe. By body-centric, I mean the whole thing is focused on the body from the get-go. I would like to compare my terminology to what happened in astronomy, where originally there was the geocentric view of the universe, but then it was heliocentric. Geocentric is the Earth as the center, heliocentric is the sun. JFK was viewed by the plotters who took his life in two contexts. He was not just a person to be killed, but also a target to be altered, and that is why this is the President Kennedy we know, and this is the President Kennedy they viewed him as, as a target to be altered. If you alter the body, you can change the story of how he died, and that is the connection between the illegitimate evidence and the false narrative in this case, and that's the way Lyndon Johnson became president. It's a story fabricated to facilitate the operation of the line of succession of the United States government. That's the relationship between bogus evidence and a false story of the shooting, this case is not about a second assassin. It's about constructing a false story to operate the line of succession. As I wrote in Best Evidence, after I discovered all this, I felt there was a pirate flag flying over the White House. The Warren Commission, for your information, was the victim of a strategic deception. They didn't get into one room and decide to lie. They believed the evidence they were given. And when we have more time, I will play the clips of Oswald saying, I didn't shoot anybody, no, sir. Now, after that introduction, thank you so much. Um, it's time for lunch. There's lunch to be served. Those who wish can go to 436 now, where this conversation will continue. We're so appreciative of your coming. We look forward to your book. Thank you so much, David Lifton. Thank you. 436. Okay. You can well, talk for the rest of the, the well, day if you want. No. Thank you. Huh? Oh, fine, yes. Yeah. Wait.
Sorry, we have to line. Yeah, okay. Huh? Is that what you wanted? The laser. Oh, I'm sorry.